Please be aware that the following contains flashing images. There will be a warning before this happens. If you need to, please skip the chapter titled Time for Tuning. Welcome back to More Fun Making It. I'm doing something new today. Should be fun. What isn't new is the subject of this video. This 48K ZX Spectrum was sent to me by Super Jim Tendo, a fellow YouTube pal who picked up this machine in his local cash converters. On this occasion, they converted his cash into a 40-year-old battered computer. The very unusual thing about this Spectrum is it's actually working, after a fashion. Jim unwisely plugged it in and it displayed the expected picture. He also sent me a pic of the insides, which piqued my interest. See that daughter board? What's that all about? Well, I'll get to that in a moment. For now, glory in the sight of what was originally sold in 1982 as a 16K Sinclair ZX Spectrum. All of the lower RAM and the associated logic chips at IC3 and 4 are soldered directly to the board. The upper RAM and its logic chip companions are socketed. The lower RAM has date codes of week 34, 1982. The ULA, the 44th week of 82. The ROM is from 82, that logic chip, 82. Even the LM1889N chip is marked 82. Safe to assume this was built sometime in late 82. Quite an early board for a pristine issue too. All of the Oki branded memory chips in the upper RAM locations are marked with a date code corresponding to 1984. All three of the visible logic chips installed at the same time are also marked 1984. Two years after this was made, someone had it professionally upgraded, probably by Sinclair themselves, judging by the quality of the work. It's also possible it came from the factory like this, although with sockets and the date codes, I find that less likely. I find this board personally interesting. My first Spectrum was a 16K. Oh, bless. Most likely built in 1982, although I never had mine upgraded. I put up with a wobbly 32K RAM pack for the whole time I owned that machine. Looking at the back of the board, you can't tell the difference between the original solder work and the upgrades. To be fair, it's all either 40 or 38 years old. As we saw from Jim's photo, we know this will display an RF modulated picture. So I'll go straight for the composite mod before anything else. The plus five volt feed for the modulator and the incoming video signal wire are removed from the motherboard and bent up out of the way. This completely disconnects the inside electronics of the modulator from the rest of the motherboard. If you buy a replacement capacitor kit from the excellent Retroleum, you receive a few bonus goodies. What I need here is a 100 microfarad capacitor and here is just the thing. Also included in the kit are a couple of BC549 transistors. I'll be needing these to complete the mod a little bit later. But for now, I only need the capacitor to connect a composite cable to the Spectrum. I prefer bending the leads this way to make the neatest installation but there's plenty of room here to have the capacitor in any old orientation. This resistor which connects the socket with the modulator video signal needs to be moved out of the way. The positive lead connects to the video output on the motherboard and the negative lead is attached to the center of the socket. With that complete, I can now switch it on. It's hard to see as the camera struggles to differentiate between the blue shades, but there is a picture here. It's showing the normal expected screen, but with a really nasty over blue coloring. That's not a problem or even a fault really. I'll go over the process to sort this a bit later. Ow, the ULA is scorching hot. Left alone, this will probably cook itself and fail with extended use. There are a couple of things I can do in order to prolong its life, and I will get to those in a bit. I've never worked on one of these with this type of daughter board before. Sir Clive, the notorious penny pincher, sourced different types of DRAM chips for the upper memory, which had different requirements. To accommodate these different pinouts, ingenious solutions were required. Upper memory is either Oki or Texas Instrument branded. Both kinds are actually 64 kilobit chips with half of the memory being defective. To make use of the good part of the chip, the computer needs to be attached to the correct half 
and on later boards there are jumpers here to achieve this. The Issue 2 boards were only designed to support Texas Instrument chips without modification. This daughter board reroutes some of the signals so the Oki chips could be used. They must have got a killer deal to go to all this trouble to use them. OK, heat is our enemy in this computer. And one of the biggest producers of it in a standard spectrum is the 7805 voltage regulator. This converts the incoming supply from the jack, which is supposed to be 9 volts, but often as much as 13 from an original power supply, down to 5 volts. The other 8 or so volts is then burned off through the heatsink. The Spectrum was always a nice place to put your hands in the winter with its warm rubber keys. Let's get rid of that old regulator and replace it with something modern that will do a better job of keeping the insides a bit cooler. I treated myself to a new toy, a microscope that I can record footage on easily. You'll be seeing a lot of this going forward. The modern replacement for the voltage regulator in this case is a Traco. The one I'm using here is a TSR1-2450, which is a drop-in replacement for the old 7805 linear regulator. There are other slightly cheaper alternatives that work just as well. A standard recap on old dried out 40 year old capacitors that have had their insides baked by excess heat is a good idea. Recapping doesn't make the most entertaining viewing so why don't we have a chat with Jim while I work. Jim, thank you for sending me what you must now consider one of the most precious items in your collection. I'm truly honoured. We can save the plugs for later, but briefly sum up in not more than 10 words what being a YouTuber means, and if you have any words left over, what YouTube is all about and why everyone else is doing it wrong. The 10 words is not a hard limit. 10 words about YouTube. For me, it means community, stupidity, fun, learning, and history. Five words left over why people are doing it wrong. The same videos on loop. I gather from our brief exchange of messages that you've placed your flag in the brown hill. Tell us about your very first experience or memory of the C64. Did it change your life? Did you just play games on it or were there creative things going on even back then? My first experience of a C64 was my brother's friend who lived on our street. Uh, he was a bit older than me, my brother. Uh, so I was the, the young hanger-on kid. I got to play on it. International soccer on cartridge. Um, just blew my mind. It was amazing. That was it. Hooked. Had to have a computer at some point. Mostly used my Commodore for playing games. That's what every kid did, really. But shoot 'em up construction kit. Loved messing around with that. And action replay. I got a cartridge for my birthday. Must have been nagging my parents for like cheats and things and such like that. But you could mess around with sprites and change bits of levels and really push games to breaking point. It was fun seeing how I could break them. I'm very old and got to see how things started, which then coloured my views on everything that came after. You're not an old man with bad knees and a terrible memory. How old were you when all of this happened? What impressions did it leave on a young Jim mind? I don't remember specifically how old I was when I first got the Commodore One Fateful Christmas. My brother being a few years older, so obviously it was a shared big present. Must have been about five or six. It left the impression that anything was possible, so the colours, sounds, types of game, what you could do. Obviously, I was a bit too young to f know that all that was going on, but just seeing the sights and the sounds and the blips, it just completely blew me away. How did it end? Do you have a final memory of the C64? I don't have a specific final memory of the Commodore 64. My brother nicked it, so he took it. With it being a shared gift, it just disappeared one day and that was it, gone. That might have been it. But he also had a copy of Mayhem in Monsterland and I very, very seldomly got to play on that one. It was his game, but I never got to touch it. So that could have been the last game I ever played on the family Commodore. What was next? Your name implies the SNES may have been giving you come-to-bed eyes around this time. My next console was of course a SNES, but my brother having a Master System and a Mega Drive, I got to play on those on and off as well. You found this lump of Rick Dickinson designed glory in a CEX, or sex or however you say it. 
Be honest now, did your heart flutter at the sight of it? I found the Spectrum in cash converters of all places. Bit strange, because you don't normally see things that sort of generation. It's usually sort of PS2. But yeah, it was, it was quite exciting to see. Um, when I got the guy to open the cupboard, we had a, a brief chat about it as well. He vaguely remembered it. So it's, it was nice having a chat with someone who was familiar with what it was. We can see from the sticker you paid the princely sum of £30 for it. How much more would it need to have been for you to gently put it back on the shelf and buy some Nintendo nonsense instead? Price-wise, about 30 was was about right, really. I think I would have gone maybe to around 40 quid. I did message a couple of friends first and say, I found a specky in cash converters. Uh, how far would you go for it? Um, so it was about the right price, to be fair. Wait a sec there, Jim. I have to explain to the nice people watching about the DCDC -DC mod. The DC DC mod is a good idea to install on all systems up to and including issue 4A. As I understand it, and all of my information is subject to my standard T's and C's, due to me learning just about everything I know from the internet, if the input voltage exceeds around 12 volts, the minus 5 volt feed to the lower RAM can be compromised. If that happens, then chips start to expire. So it's a good thing to prevent this from happening. Most modern replacement power supplies will be rated at the required 9 volts, but an original Sinclair PSU can be feeding in anything up to 13 or more volts. The DC DC mod is different on each revision due to some of the required changes being incorporated in later versions, but the issue too is by far the easiest. Just one extra capacitor and a replacement resistor. It's easier to replace the resistor first as the new capacitor will be in the way. Here I'm tinning the two points the cap will attach to. The positive lead will attach to the positive lead of the capacitor at C34 and the negative lead is then soldered to the left lead of resistor R58. And that's it. More from Jim. What will be the first game you load up when you get the Spectrum back into your meaty man paws? The first game I'm probably going to load up will either be Booty or I want to compare School Days to the Commodore version, see how it plays on the actual hardware. So, is that it for the C64? According to most of the internet, you're not allowed to like both. So, which will it be? I'm Commodore till I die, so I'm always going to go for the Commodore. It's like having a NES and a Master System. You can have both. Thank you for taking part in whatever the hell this was. Tell everyone where they can find you and why they should. You can find me on YouTube, Super Jim Tendo. I don't take YouTube seriously or gaming. It's fun just to muck about. So if that's your mindset, come say hello. Thank you, Jim. I look forward to hearing about your Spectrum adventures. Links to Jim's channel and Twitter are in the description. The other big source of heat, especially in this one, is the ULA. These are socketed from the factory, which makes installing a heatsink difficult as there's not enough room under the top of the case for it and the socket. At Arcadesy on Twitter tells me it's possible to install a low profile heatsink to these, but I didn't know that at the time and I don't have any of those anyway. The more standard way to deal with this problem is to remove the socket and solder the ULA directly to the board. I used to feel this was far too risky given how hard it was to remove stuff from these boards. But now I have my trusty, kinda, desoldering station, I feel much more confident about the process. In goes the chip, sands the socket. And on goes the new heatsink. Before I move on to tuning the display problems, I need to replace the transistors at TR1 and TR2. This will brighten the display and it's probably a good idea to do this before delicate tuning takes place. The transistors need to be installed the opposite way round from the silk screen markings. Some fresh solder on these big high stress joints.
The old original flux is always tricky to remove. A little light scraping loosens it up enough to brush away with IPA. Right, time for tuning. Flashing warning. Please skip ahead to the next chapter if you are photosensitive. The picture hasn't changed a bit despite all the new components I installed. Still this nasty blue which is quite unpleasant to look at. There are ways to do this with a multimeter which I will link to in the description. But if you have an oscilloscope the job is so much easier. Just attach the scope to the video output and turn the two variable resistors to make the thick line here thinner. Even an idiot like me can't get this wrong. Using the trim pots on the board I can adjust it until the line is as thin and clean as possible and it should give me a perfect picture. Oh, well, uh, maybe a bit of manual tuning is required too. That's much better. The other two pots are variable capacitors and allow you to change the rate at which the dot crawl on the screen moves. It's almost possible to slow it down close to zero with patience, but that setting will be specific to each display. I'll get it down to an acceptable level and hope it works well with Jim's TV. The membrane in this spectrum is probably original, or maybe a replacement a long time ago. It looks like this was a very well used machine and issue 2 keyboard membranes are usually dry as a mummy's jockstrap by this stage of their life. But this one seems to be in really good condition. Some of the keys are not registering so I take a piece of paper and gently rub it over the exposed end of the membrane to clean the connections. A key that wasn't working a moment ago is now working after a light clean of the end connectors. I'm moving it about to try and upset it and it's still working well. I'm very happy to leave this in here. There's no point changing something that's working perfectly fine. This isn't the prettiest looking machine, but I see a certain charm in its wear and tear. The scars tell a story of this being a much loved machine, or used by someone with sandpaper for skin. I put up a poll on the Twitters and asked everybody what should be done, and the consensus was to leave it as it is. Jim agreed to this, but he'll probably replace the case with a luminous green one and install RGB lights or something once he gets it back. None of the lettering on the faceplate has worn off. I can't guarantee how long it might stay that way. So I decided to give it a coat of matte lacquer to stop any further wear, at least for a while. I've no idea if Jim moisturises. Before I can spray, I need to straighten the faceplate as much as possible. Normally, I'd place it between two pieces of card and crush it flat in my vise. But this is one of the models with brass tabs to hold it in place, so it won't go in the vise. Instead, I protect the plate with some nice thick card and hit it with a hammer. This seems to work very well. Note to self, buy more hammers. The key mat gets a thorough clean, removing many years of finger cheddar. And on a nice warm but rainy day, I give the faceplate a few coats of lacquer. Here's a blurry close-up of the lacquer just after application. It has a worrying orange peel texture. Let's see what happens when it dries after a few coats. Perfect. The finish is exactly the same as the original. That is a huge win. It's always risky painting something. A coat of renaissance wax will bring out the luster of the luxurious black textured plastic and give it some protection. Mmm, luxurious. The only thing left to do is put it back together and test it out.
For some reason, I used to really love the 48K specky keyboard. It's a terrible thing. I'll speed this typing up to make me look good. I always forget to put these things back in. Sigh. Damn it. It has to go back in. The TV socket looks terrible without it. And there we have it. Not so much a repair as a warm fuzzy walk down memory lane with a pal. Do give Jim's channel a look. He might be totally off his rocker, but he does make some very funny videos that keep the rest of us YouTubers honest. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Oh,